Christ alone we stand. Amen? Amen. You know, when the day and age in which we live, uh, sometimes the events, uh, things that are going on are a little bit difficult to accept. Uh, sometimes our understanding about what's happening uh, is a little bit clouded. We don't fully understand uh, what's going on, but we have to believe, uh, even as we think about, we've been talking about the fact that we are in the last days, uh, and when we realize that as believers, uh, and how the last days are described in Scripture for us, and all the things that are involved that are there, uh, we know that the Lord is going to return. And uh, we are going to spend eternity with Him. You know, sometimes uh, we are need to just be reminded of who God is and uh, how He is involved in our lives and the things that are going on. And so when we, as believers, uh, have recognized our sinful estate uh, and we have honestly and, and in our hearts understood what God has done for us on the cross and put our faith and trust in Him, uh, we know that we'll have eternity and we'll spend eternity with Him. And uh, we praise God for that. You know, sometimes it's confusing, you know, maybe even sometimes alarming uh, to people when we see things that are going on around us, uh, the direction of our nation and the things that are happening there certainly, and even in our personal lives, some of the struggles we have, uh, the difficulties that come from time to time. Uh, so to that end, uh, I think it's important for us to, to grasp, if we can, a better view uh, and an understanding, not only of who God really is, but what are the attributes and how can we uh, look at the attributes of God and then live with better confidence and hope uh, in the day and age in which we find ourselves. So in order to do that, uh, we need to know what God's power is really like, and as a result, put our confidence and our trust in Him uh, and not in ourselves. Uh, in this day and age uh, that we find ourselves. So, we are going to begin a series of messages, uh, Lord willing. Uh, we're going to entitle this, The Power of God's Attributes. The Power of God's Attributes. And then try to understand the greatness of God and how that gives us confidence in Him. In order to do that, I think we need to be like the Apostle Paul. So if you want to uh, turn an opening here to the book of Philippians chapter 3, uh, we need to have the same understanding, if you would, or the same mindset uh, of the Apostle Paul as he describes it here in the book of Philippians, uh, right into the church of Philippi, uh, and then certainly uh, to us as well. Notice, if you would, we'll just take a couple verses out of Philippians chapter 3, if you're using a pew Bible, it's page 1350, excuse me. Philippians chapter 3, go down to verse 8. Paul is talking here not only about the circumstances in his own life uh, at that particular time, but he says, I count all things lost for the excellence of what? The knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, I, I want to all of these things to help me to better understand and to know God. Drop down to verse 10, if you would. Paul continues to say, I want to know Him, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death. If by any means I may even attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also has laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. What does he say next? I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have the same mind, the same mindset. Have the same understanding of what's going on and, and how God is involved. So in, in the purpose uh, in, of our study, what I'd like us to do over these coming weeks is to grasp the attributes of God and understand them a little bit better uh, with some examples in Scripture and then allow them to encourage us. And, and I think the best place to begin, uh, where we're going to begin today, I guess you didn't have much choice on that, did you? Uh, the place I'd like us to begin is with God's omniscience. His omniscience, the omniscience of God. 
The fact that God knows what church? Everything. I want you to just pause for a moment and think about that. That God knows everything. And as you think about that in terms of your life or in terms of the life of the church, our lives, uh, the life of, of this particular nation, so on and so forth, there's no question that God can't answer. There's nothing that he can't solve. There's not a problem that confuses God. There's not anything that's going on that surprised him or that he's shocked by what's happening. So every time you see or you hear of things that are beginning to look worse and worse, if you would, in, in, the, in our human understanding, know this, that God already knows that that's taking place. And that's part of his plan. That's part of the way he is bringing us to this point. So, so take heart, uh, church. The psalmist says this in Psalm 147, verse 5. His understanding, speaking of God, has no limit. So God fully understands. So that should give us some confidence and hope as we live through this day uh, and age where we find ourselves right now. So Father God, just teach us about your omniscience today. Help us to be encouraged, to have confidence and hope because we know that you are a God who knows all things. And so Father, we praise you for that. Might we find power in your attributes as we go through our lives every single day. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's look at an example of God's omniscience first, all right? So let's go to the book of Daniel, if you would. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. It's page 1019 uh, there in your pew Bible. We want to see an example of God's omniscience uh, as it unfolds here uh, in Daniel chapter 2. <clears throat> I'll give you a moment to get there because that's one of those Old Testament books we don't always go to. But we should. Daniel chapter 2. Now in Daniel chapter 2, we're not going to uh, do an exhaustive study uh, on this chapter, but just to give us an idea <clears throat> of the omniscience of God so that we can, we can better understand how it uh, plays out in our own lives even today. Notice in verse 1, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. Uh, and you'll probably recall uh, the historical account there. And, and he, can't, he can't sleep. He can't figure out what the dream is all about. So he calls all of the wise men. The, the Bible calls them sorcerers. Um, we call them magicians. Uh, these men that would come and, and try to give him an understanding of his dream. And so he asked all these wise men to come in and, and reveal it to him. But you'll notice they can't do it. Now back, drop down to verse 12. Because they're unable to do it, the king gets so angry, it says, he was furious. And so he gave them the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Now I want you to think about something and be reminded of something. There was a man by the name of Daniel, and Daniel and his friends were taken from their nation because of their intellect, because of their wisdom because of the things that they were able to do, and they were brought into the kingdom of Babylon, and so Nebuchadnezzar would use their knowledge and their ability to help him to even run the nation. So Daniel would have been part of this group of men. And now Daniel at this point had not been asked to, to do anything, but the king is going to get rid of all of these wise men because they can't give him any of the answers. So look what Daniel does down in verse 16. In verse 16, Daniel goes in to the king and he says to the king, uh, let, me, let me have a little bit of time uh, and I will give you the interpretation. Then he goes to his house, verse 17. And what does he do, church? What's he do with his friends? He starts to talk to them. And he says they might seek what? In verse 18 then. The mercies from whom? God. So he's really having a little prayer service. So he gets these men together. And they begin to pray that God would give them an understanding of what was happening. And in verse 19 you'll notice God answers that prayer, doesn't he? It says, then the secret was revealed 
to Daniel in a night vision. And what does he do as a result of that? He blesses whom? The God of heaven. So he thanks God for giving him the understanding of what this dream was really all about. He doesn't, he doesn't give himself any credit. He does all of this, and he prays for this wisdom from God, and God gives him the interpretation. And we know that. I'm going to drop down, have you drop down for a moment to verse 23, because in verse 23, you'll notice what Daniel does, or Daniel proclaims. He says, I thank you, and I praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, you have made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand, the king's request about his dream. So Daniel is giving credit and homage to God who gives him the answer. Now notice, if you would, back to verse, <coughs> excuse me, back to verse 20, Daniel in speaking, he says this, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, and would you underline, if you are into that thing in your Bible, for what? Wisdom and might are his. Wisdom and might belong to God. Now notice what he continues to say. He says God changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings. He raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise. He acknowledge, gives knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. The all-encompassing, if you would, knowledge of God. We are talking about God's omniscience. His knowledge of all things. Even to the point, if you would, in verse 21, where he raises up political leaders and brings them into powers or positions of powers because it fulfills his plan, his undertaking. Notice then what happens when Daniel comes to the king. This is very important. Down to verse 26. The king answers and says to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, that was his uh, his name in, in that kingdom, if you would. Are you able to make known to me the dream and its interpretation? Daniel answers in the presence and the, of the king and says this. The servant which the king, the, excuse me, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare it to him. But, verse 28, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he, notice is capitalized, is it not? speaking about God, who reveals secrets, has made known to you what will be. So Daniel credits the omniscience of God, his all-knowing ability to give him the interpretation, and eventually, as you would continue to read the book of Daniel that we'll research later, the prophecy here in Daniel of all of the future events that will take place for mankind. And so God knows all of this. And the, so, so church, here's what you need to be encouraged with this example and as we continue in these thoughts this morning. The God of the Bible is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows everything about what's going on, but he also knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. And that's what ought to give you some confidence and hope. So our brother Dan, for example, all right? Sorry this is online. I hope that doesn't bother you. Okay, so our brother Dan, for example, came to us in prayer a couple weeks ago about God 
It's opportunity. You're in the opportunity that was given for this particular job, this particular position. So we began to pray for that. Dan prayed for that. We asked you to pray for that as well. God knew that that position would be given to him, but he also used that period of time in between for us to call upon him, to trust him, that God would give the details or work all of those details out. Why is that so important? So that at the end of the period of time of asking God for his wisdom and direction, when all of that comes to fruition, who gets the honor and the glory for the answer to that? God. He knew it ahead of time because he was omniscient. So Dan could, in essence, if you want to, Dan could say, well, God knows, so I don't need to do anything. I don't need to pray about this. I don't need to seek God's wisdom because he already knows whether that position would be mine or not. You and I don't have that, if you will, luxury. That's why God has provided prayer. God has provided the opportunity for us to go to him. Because what does it do then? It builds, in Dan's case, or in the church, the case of the church, because we're praying, it builds our confidence and our trust in God. He knows that, what's going to happen, but then he allows that time. So the God of the Bible is omniscient. He knows all things. And, and so as a result of that, it ought to give us some confidence and hope uh, as we go through life. Now, I want to share an illustration with you that you probably, I, I, I think about it a lot. Some people say I have OCD, so I don't know if that's the case or not. But if you're, if you're, if, if you're driving somewhere, you know, you get in your car and, and you're going to drive somewhere and so on and so forth. Everything in front of what you can see, it all, it all seems like kind of confusing. So if you want to end up at point A over there, you might have to make a whole bunch of turns in order to get there. And, and it's, almost, it's almost like going into a forest and knowing that you've got to get to the other end of that forest. But there's a lot of different paths and trails that go in all kinds of different directions. And it looks a little confusing. If you, you, when you first see it, you kind of, you kind of have this little, you know, it just, I, I, nothing's organized enough. If you've ever had the opportunity to fly in an airplane, however, when you're up in the sky and you look down upon the earth, you know what you notice? All the roads are very neatly organized. The developments that people live in, it's all, it's all so neat and organized. Even the cornfields are straight roads. Everything's so neat and organized. And it's so much easier to see it when you're looking down on it. That's God when we think about our lives. Everything in our life sometimes gets all confused and, and, and so on, but, but God sees and knows everything that's going on. So to him, your life is not a confused mess. The things that are going on in this world are not a confused mess to God. His omniscience, he, he understands all of this. And he, even the political leaders put in a position, if you would, to fulfill God's plan, to fulfill his desire. So when we see something that a political leader does or whoever it may be and it makes us angry, you know, we're upset about this, that, and the other thing, and we could stand here all day and talk about those types of things, and we probably do after church, I know, when you first come in, what did you see what they did this week? And, and we, we, we are somewhat confused as to all of these sins. Are, just, just remember this. God put them there to fulfill his plan, his desire. So even though we're paying $3.69 or whatever it is at the pump, God knows what's going on. That's part of his omniscience. And, and so when we think about that in terms of life, we can trust God that he knows what's best for us even when we can't see it because he can. So let's see if we can get a couple lessons here quickly in the next moments that we have together that, that, can, that can help us to better understand it. So if, in order to do that first, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Job in the Old Testament, Job chapter 1, it's page 576 in your pew Bibles there. The first lesson that I think 
we can grasp, because of God's omniscience, because He is an omniscient God, He knows about your feelings, He knows about your sufferings, He knows about your frustrations in life. Think about Job for a minute. Okay, so you're in Job chapter 1, and in Job chapter 1, you'll notice that Job was described as a man who was blameless and upright. He's not talking about being alive. He's talking about the way he lived. He feared God, and he shunned or he turned away from evil or evil practices. This was a man who was living the way God wanted him to live. Okay? Now, as you would read the book of Job, um, you understand that he suffered a lot of affliction, probably more than any of us have ever have ever suffered. There was physical problems like the boils that he had, uh, the physical things that came into his life that God allowed. Um, certainly, you know, his wife tried to get him to turn away from God. Uh, and then, of course, the biggest one that we probably remember is his entire family died. And yet, in all of that, he suffered all of that, and then his friends started to come and give him, give him some advice. So go over to chapter 11 of Job, page 8, 585, and I want you to notice what Job reveals to his friends. And in Job chapter 11, verse 7, Job says this, Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are what, church? Higher than heaven. What can you do? They're even deeper than Shul, the grave. What can, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Speaking of the things of God. The omniscience of God. Listen, because God is omniscient, he knows about how you feel. He knows your sufferings. He knows your frustrations in life. If you read the whole book of Job um, and you do a little bit of research, you'll find that Job asks 48 questions in this book. And those questions are primarily, uh, he's confused. Um, he is frustrated. There's pain because of his suffering. And in the terms of asking those questions, Job almost believes that God is silent, the apparent silence of God. Interestingly enough, as you would read the book, God asked Job 84 questions in response to his questions. Have you ever done that to anybody? Somebody asks you a question and then you ask them a question? But what's interesting is, when God asked those questions of Job throughout the book, so read the book of Job again this week. He reveals to Job that his, Job's knowledge is limited. His understanding is limited. And those questions point Job to the fact that God is the all-knowing sustainer of the universe. That is what you and I need to be reminded of. God that we worship his attribute of omniscience church he knows what's going on in your life he knows what's going on with the frustrations that you have he understands your suffering he understands how you feel uh, there may be some of you here today that think oh well nobody knows what I'm going through no, nobody understands nobody can, can really grasp the pain that I have let me just assure you, church, God knows you. And he knows what's going on in your life. And he understands all of that. Do you remember um, with the, the historical account of the children of Israel when they were in bondage in Egypt? And the taskmaster, that was during Moses' time, and the taskmasters, they made them make their own bricks. you remember that? And uh, they would make the bricks for the Egyptians so that they could build their uh, ivory palaces and so on and so forth. In the midst of all of that, and, and they come back and they're complaining to Moses because he says he's going to lead them out and all of this kind of stuff. 
Listen to what God says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. Jot this verse down. I have seen their affliction. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. We need to be encouraged. Because God is omniscient, he knows all the frustrations that you have in life right now. He knows the things that are going on, the difficulties that you're having. In addition to the physical aspects of life, he knows everything about you. Doesn't that give you some hope and some confidence to know that the God who you put your faith and your trust in knows everything about you? He knows what's going on in your life? It ought to encourage you because he knows what's going on. But he also knows your life and he knows your future as well. Can I remind you of something? In Psalm 139, we've looked at this passage before, but he knew about your life even before you were born. Do you remember what the psalmist says? In Psalm 139, verse 16, he, he pens these words. The days given to me were recorded in your book before any of them ever began. Think about that. So when we have people telling us that uh, life does not begin at conception, they don't understand the truth of an omniscient God. They don't understand that God knew you even before you were conceived. You were born into this life and God knew everything about you. Jeremiah says this in chapter 29, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you a future and a hope. You know, people today are they're, they're, are enamored with uh, with the future. Uh, astrology, uh, you know, reading tea leaves, horoscopes, and biorhythms, all of those types of things. That's the wrong source. God knows everything about my today and everything about my tomorrow. And I should be encouraged by that. Remember the response of Jeremiah in chapter 33, verse 3. Call unto me, God says, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you don't even know about. I shared something with you 20 years ago, so I know you probably forgot it. But uh, someone wrote a prayer one time, and I thought I'd share it with you again this morning. And it goes something like this. Lord, you know what I'm about to face today. You know the interruptions that I'm going to face. You know every cranky person in my office. I'm going to add, you know every cranky person in my family. You know about my flat tire. You know about the traffic jam. You know that my son and I are going to argue today. You know that I'm going to spill coffee on my outfit. You've already seen it. So here's the prayer. Would you give me the strength to cope with this day? See, if God already knows all of those things, he already can provide what you need to get through that. Now, those are just minor things. But I added this to the prayer. Lord, you know what's going on around us in this world. Help me to have confidence and hope because of your omniscience. Make that part of your prayer. If you believe, you truly believe in a sovereign God, you truly believe in an omniscient God, then everything that's going on around us is not a surprise to God. And if it's not a surprise to God, he knows what the next step is. In your life, the life of the church, even the life of this nation, it's all part of God's plan. That ought to give you some confidence and some hope in this day and age. Because there aren't a lot of good things going on that gives us some hope, even in this day and age in which you live. He knows all about your life. So, so just like Job and, and all of those characters, can I share this with you as well? 
this is the part of the message where we may not be as comfortable with. God also knows how we live today when it comes to our faults and our failures, our sin. Listen to what the psalmist says. Psalm chapter 69, verse 5. Oh God, you know my foolishness. And I don't know why he added this. And my sins are not hidden from you. And the reason I said that, you know, sometimes we want to forget the omniscience of God when it comes to things that are a little bit uncomfortable in our life. You know, it's, it's uncomfortable to know that <laughs> You don't have any secrets with God. You don't have any secrets from God. You know, a lot of times we mention secret sins. You know, those sins that we try to hide from God, those, those, those sins in our life that, you know, we, we, we hide them in the closet somewhere and we, we lock the door. In omniscient, God already knows what's behind the door. That's not said to scare you. Solomon says this in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. A man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. So church, let's be honest with God, okay? Um, you know, the, the fact that he knows my failures, my sin, you know, that I would be honest with him, and that I would repent and turn and change those things in my life through his power. I'm not talking about salvation, we're talking about our life afterwards. Yes. Now, I'm not going to list your secret sins. Your secret sins? I Maybe that's not the right thing. I'm not going to list any of those secret sins. But we know what they are. They're not hidden from God either. <coughs> because we have an omniscient God. He knows all things. Let, let, let me just leave you with this as well. God knows also about your faithfulness to him. You know, we get discouraged on the negative side of things, you know, that God knows all about me and all of the sinfulness of my life and so on and so forth. But let me just encourage you, you know, every time you choose not to sin, when, when you choose to do that which is right, when you resist temptation with God's power, when, when, you, when you live by the biblical convictions that you have, God sees your faithfulness to him as well. He's not sitting on his throne looking to destroy you. We share a verse of scripture all times when it comes to our salvation and our life and so on and so forth. We are not condemned in Christ. Okay? We are not condemned. We have not, we, that's all been judged because of what Christ did on the cross. Now that doesn't give us a license to sin. Amen? Right? But to know that, that, that I am I'm the loved of God, and God, I want to, I'll put it this way, uh, God is, it's almost like God is kind of cheering you on to do that which is right, mm -hmm. if you would. In Galatians chapter 6, uh, Paul says, don't grow weary in well-doing, but because in so doing, you will reap the harvest. You will reap that which is good. Be, be encouraged that, you know, you have an omniscient God who sees everything that's going on in your life. He sees everything that's going on in this world. And so, therefore, when I recognize that, that gives me power and confidence because I know that he is in charge. He is in control. Arthur Pink put it this way, quote, Though he be invisible to us, speaking of God, we are not so to him. We are not invisible to him. Psalmist says in Psalm 139, verses 2 and 3, You know God, you know my downsitting, you know my uprising, you understand my thoughts afar off, you compass my path and my lying down, on, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Hallelujah. That gives me confidence and hope to be able to walk through this day, to be able to walk through tomorrow, knowing that God knows everything that's going on in my life, and as a result of my walking with Him, my life is pleasing to Him because of the way God works in my life. Gain some confidence and some hope, church, by knowing that God is an omniscient God. Praise Him and thank Him that He knows all about you and He knows what's coming tomorrow, even though we don't fully understand that. 
give him that glory. Will you, church? Father God, thank you that you are an omniscient God. We give you praise and glory, and we honor you because of that. Father, you are so good to us, and you watch over us. Help us to have some confidence and some hope and to be able to trust in you because of who you are and because of your omniscience. Father, this attribute is so key to us walking through this life. Because to be quite honest, Father, it's, it's confusing to us in our human nature. We, don't, we just don't understand why you're allowing things to happen. Why, why this is occurring in, in our lives or even in this nation and in this world. But Father, you are an omniscient God. You see all things. You know all things. Might that give us the encouragement, the confidence, and the hope to trust in you. You are a good God, and we love you and praise you and thank you. In Jesus' matchless name, amen.